All right. Good morning, everyone. What is it, Monday? The 4th? Yes, it's Tuesday. Tuesday? Oh, good. Then your project's already due, and so nobody's going to have any questions on it today. Uh, yeah, I can see we have a reduced crowd. Um, who likes jobs? Having jobs, having internships, that kind of stuff? Uh, there'll be a representative, I can't remember his exact position, uh, from US Foods. They're one of like the 10th largest private companies in the US. Um, he's going to come and speak for 15 minutes on Wednesday in the morning. He's going to talk to you about the cool like tech uh, development kind of positions they have and that they're actively looking for interns. So show up on Wednesday, do me proud, and then we'll continue with the regular stuff. Questions on that? All right. You know we're in the final stretch. We only have a month left. Why are you reminding us? <laughs> How's There's that not, not good news? Time. Not so enough time for what? To do. For what? To pass all my classes. To pass, pass all your classes? classes. That started Five at the beginning minutes. of the semester. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, that's awesome. Yeah. There's going to be like another, there's going to be like one more project. In that one more project, one more midterm. The project will be description will be released later today. Are there any, are there any there's also one more homework left as well? Yes. There'll be probably two more homework. Oh. Okay. That way you can make sure we cover all the stuff. We can do one on type systems, we'll do one on lambda calculus. Yeah. When you say when midterm, do you mean final or midterm? Midterm. Okay. Three midterms and a final. Uh, and why are they called the midterms? Because it's in, in, yes. Not midway through the term, but in the middle of the term. I don't know, man. That's just what the, they call it. <laughs> I didn't come up with it. Exams would be a more appropriate name. Yeah. Yeah. Exams. That doesn't scare you enough. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you need to be terrified into studying. I'm pretty sure there's been teaching studies on that. You could have, you could have like one quiz, one test, and one exam. Then you, you could just have one final. final. Would you like final that? One final for your entire grade? No. Like in other areas? I've taken a class like that. It's yeah. kind of terrifying. They do that in law school, right? They have one final test, and that's your entire 100% of your grade is that one test. We could do that. Okay. Why don't they? No, some of them do. Oh, yeah. well, it's not fun. It has pros and cons. Okay, so okay, so we've talked about we talked about we learned about type systems, right? We learned about all the ways we can specify types in a type system. We talked about how we can actually automatically infer the types in a program, which is what you're doing for Project Four, and hopefully have mostly already done, or are going to spend 10 a.m. to midnight to finish. Now we need to talk about how does the compiler actually make these constructs work, right? How does the compiler, how, how does it allow us to use local variables and function calls and all these sorts of things? Um, so this is really what we're going to be focusing on. Right, so what's the difference between a location and a, and a name? Based on what we talked about with like box circle diagrams. Location is the box and name is the thing with the arrow to the box. Yes, so location is the box. So what would that represent like on the actual machine? It's bound, bound to a memory address. Memory, yeah. So that box, right, we've been talking about it abstractly, but that box is memory address on the machine, right? And that's why it has some address because it's addressable in the memory of the machine. So what is the name? What What is? What's that? A reference to that memory address? A reference <laughs> to that memory address? Kind of, yeah. Um, is it a constant reference? No, because you can change. Who's that name for? Does the machine use that name? All the time. It's just for the programmer. For the programmer? Right, so it's actually a construct created for the programmer, right? When you declare some variable foo, right, the compiler, the computer only cares about memory and values inside that memory, right? So they only care what's at memory address 10,000, right? They don't care that memory address 10,000 is actually variable foo in your program, right? Because the computer only cares about its view of memory. And so this is what we're going to think about. So there is this... Right, but we can see, we've been looking at how kind of we can map names to locations, right? We can see that, okay, this name foo is bound to some location. 
But how does the compiler actually do this? Um, so how, how does it, how do you think, I mean, how would, if you were writing a compiler, you're on a desert island, right? How would you map names to memory locations? Okay, similar way to an enum. Similar way to an enum, in what sense? How is an enum? A label given to an integer? And then just talks about the integer rather than the label. Mm, talks about the integer rather than the label? Cool. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the idea, right? So it's going to be giving it essentially symbolic names. So this is what we're going to look at in this process. So for this whole section, we're going to assume static scoping. Because dynamic <coughs> scoping kind of changes significantly how we're going to do this. And so I've kind of debated about how to teach this section. Um, one way to do it is to kind of talk abstractly about function frames and variables stored on functions. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm not, I mean, I can do the abstract stuff, but I'm much more interested in the details of how real systems and real things work. So we're going to look at here, we're going to look at as an example of how this is done, we're going to look at how GCC compiles your programs to 32-bit x86 instructions and how that maps to the concepts we're talking about here. So we're actually going to look at exactly how that compilation, how uh, the resulting x86 code looks like and how it does this mapping of names to memory addresses. So what are all the types of variables we can have in our program? <coughs> okay, good point. So we just spent a few weeks talking about types. Uh, more abstract types, like what kinds of variables could you have in your program? Numbers. Numbers, even more abstract. So, uh, values. Values. Pointers. Pointers. Strings. I guess I could strings just strings values. values. Strings. Where do they live? I mean, how do we know about the scoping rules? Let's try to frame it maybe with scoping. They're defined in the language, yes. But what are the different types of scoping rules and how does that affect? There's dynamic and static scoping. Dynamic and static scoping rules. So we're focusing only on the static scoping rules, right? So can you access any variable name, the name that's declared anywhere? No. No? So what are some of the ways that you can declare variables? Locally. Global, so you can have global variables. What does it mean for a variable to be global? That's accessible anywhere. That it's accessible anywhere. So how many copies of that variable should there ever be at one point? One. There should only be one copy of that variable. What are some other ways you could declare variables? So globally. On the stack. On the stack? What's another word for that? Uh, yeah, we'll go with, yeah, so global, local, opposite of global, local, right, yeah, so, yeah, we'll go with local, so we can do local scoping to decide, okay, this is actually, um, this is a local variable that's only available in this function, and we know we've looked at it, it's actually allocated on the stack. So let's look at these things, so for global variables, Right. Where can a compiler put global variables? You're a compiler writer. Where are you going to put in memory the global variables? On where? The static space. The static space. What does that mean, static space? That it's un unmovable. Unmovable. Or it's unchangeable. But it's not. It's not you can't change a global variable. Change global variables. Or its memory location is constant. Just like, uh, it's going with the rest of the code. What was that? It's in with the rest of the code? What does that mean? Uh, it's in the same memory location. Ah, in the same memory location, yeah. yeah. It's kind of like a separate space, kind of like the code, it's kind of like full variables and stack. Right, okay, so it's going to have a specific layout. Um, right, so where can we, so in general, right, so global variables are one thing, right, so we can think about where to put those. But what, what choice does the compiler have about where to put variables in general, right? So it can put variables in memory, right? But where else can the compiler put variables? Registers. 
registers. Yeah, right? So every CPU has some regi well, most CPUs, if they're register-based CPUs, have registers so that they can perform computations. So maybe the compiler's smart enough, they can tell, hey, I actually don't need to ever store this variable in memory. I can just leave it in this register. Where else? Is this the only choices? On the disk. Yeah, right? We could, could you write a pro compiler to do this, to store, yeah, right? And some of you are in operating systems. You guys talk about swap, swap files, what happens there? That's what they do. Right? So they're implicitly, right, the, uh, the memory, so the compiler is storing variables in memory, and the swap, the operating system, if it decides you're not going to use this memory, will actually put that memory onto disk, right? And, but your program has no knowledge that that has actually happened. But the compiler, there's, not, there's nothing to say that, that variables have to be in memory. The compiler could write, compile your program such that your global variables or any variables are on disk. What about in the cloud? Could you think of like a crazy compiler where like variables are all over the place, distributed, maybe it uses like, like a blockchain, huh? That sounds like it would be a mess. Yeah. Lots of things is a mess. Is computing not a mess right now? <laughs> or do you just fully understand that mess? So it seems. That mess seems a lot less messy than cloud. A lot less messy. Let's sort. Partially sort messes. I mean, yeah, I guess you could do that. Why not? Yeah, it could be, right? You could have a variable that lives in a Dropbox, like on a Dropbox file or something, so it gets passed to you different could also computers. Run like a distribute, uh, like a distributed system compiler. Like if you're compiling terabytes of data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So outside of the scope of like just what we're talking about here, when companies do they actually store variables in the cloud, or do they just create a local copy? talk back and forth. Yeah, that's a tricky, it's actually a tricky question to answer. So think about actually Bitcoin, right? So Bitcoin is a distributed database, essentially. It's essentially, you can think of it as an append-only database that's distributed throughout all the Bitcoin participants. So the global, quote, quote, variables of who has what Bitcoins are actually stored as transactions in this blockchain, right? I mean, they are also probably stored in memory, right? Because we want... Uh, when we do computations, we don't want to go to the cloud every time to get some values. Uh, but there's a lot of cases where actually, yeah, the data that you want, you want it to be stored. And so you can think about maybe I want to write a programming language that does this automatically, right? That does this distributed cloud storage so that the programmer, their API, they only have to worry about global variables. They don't have to worry about all that low level syncing and cloud storage and all the problems with distributed systems, about how do you know if you have the right values, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I just want you to think about different ways that this could be done, right? The fact that we do it now with putting variables in memory, that doesn't mean that it has to be done this way. Uh, somebody mentioned compiling large amounts of source code. Uh, so actually, last time I remember Google, if I remember correctly, Google has all employees basically have access to almost all the source code. And you can like check out their whole source code. They're using kind of like a perforce clone, um, and then because the repository is huge, so I think when you want to compile something, it'll compile on like other servers and systems and like do a distributed cloud compilation and then give you the results back on your local machine, but it looks like you're accessing it from the file system. And it also does crazy tricks with like caching files that you actually use locally on your disk and putting other ones in their cloud system. Anyway, uh, yeah, so you can do a lot of cool stuff with this. So, when we think about global variables, right, what are the constraints on global variables? What are, from the programmer's perspective, what does it mean for a value to be global, and what constraints does this apply to what the compiler can do? For instance, who can access global variables? Anything. Anything? Can my program access your program's global variables? Anything in that program. Anything in that program? What do you define as a program? <coughs> serious questions over here. We're getting philosophical today. What are you doing here? Right, so how do you define a program? Is it something, so can you compile something that's not a program? Why not? Can you compile libraries that other programs can include and use? Mm -hmm. 
Can you have global variables inside those libraries? Sure. So who can access the global variables inside those libraries? Any files that access the library. Yeah, any other programs that are compiled linked to those libraries, right? So we have to have some way of knowing, right? So the other programs have to know what are the global variables. But that way when we write our code, our program our compiler, when it's compiling these two files, knows how to actually get that global variable. Uh, what are the restrictions on, can you have constraints or restrictions on global variables in something like C? Well, there's public, private, protected, uh, package. Right, yeah, so those are constraints that you can have on class, like instance variables in a lot of class-based languages. Those are usually not global, although you could have a, I mean, just think about our classes, global, like in Java, you could have a private class that's, uh, you could also have, I think, is there some way to limit a class to only one file in Java? That'd be internal or packaged, I'm not sure. So what about on global variables? Did you know you can declare variables that uh, in C, I believe if you declare variables with a static keyword that are global, they're only accessible within that file only. So they're global in the sense that anywhere in that file can access it, but it actually gives you some kind of encapsulation to say that, well, other programs can't mess with this variable. Okay, so how is this actually done? So how do we find out how our compiler works? What are some ways you want to learn how GCC works or Clang or something? Magic. What? Magic? magic? Ha! There is no magic. It's all computers. <laughs> so you can look at the documentation. That's definitely one approach. You can look at the stack. Look at the stack. That's good. What else? You guys live in the beautiful age of open source code. Right? Stack over. All right, you can look at Stack Overflow examples so you can have somebody else's crappy interpretation of what it does. <laughs> read the source? Yeah, yeah, you can read the source code, right? That's the beauty of open source tools and open source compilers. You can read the source. If you ever need to figure out how something in Linux works, you can download the entire source. I mean, it's gonna take you a little while, right, to figure <laughs> out what's going on, but you have that ability, right? So you can do all those. What else? Is there anything else? Reverse engineer. You said what was that? Reverse engineer. Reverse engineer. In what sense? What does that mean? Take like something that converts the machine code or whatever back into. So like get the raw executable format mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and basically read and have something that can open it up so you see the move it like assembly code or whatever and go through that and figure out exactly what's going on and then okay. kind of read Good. Them. Yeah, so that's, kind of, and we've actually, I think, established basically all the different ways you can try to understand a system, right? You can read the documentation, you can read the source code, you can read what other people have written about that system, and you can try to reverse engineer it yourself based on the output, right? You give some input to the system, you see what, what it outputs, and then you go back and try to answer, okay, why did it do this, right? What happens if I change things? So that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna try to look at and try to understand what GCC, how GCC works and how it, where it puts global variables. So we're gonna have a super simple example. So we have global variables A, B, and C, right? Two ints and a float. We have our main method. We're gonna set A to 10, B to 100, C to 10.45. Uh, we're gonna set A is equal to A plus B and we're gonna return zero. <coughs> so for global variables, right? So let's think about it this way. So, okay, those other crazy ways of maybe thinking about variables notwithstanding, in normally you want to put it somewhere in memory, right, of your program. But how, how does the compiler decide where to put these global variables? Yeah, 
so that's actually where, well, when the program's compiled in the elf, the elf, which is the, um, <coughs> uh, I forget the name, what elf stands for, executable and loading format or something like that, um, or linking format, maybe that's what the elf's for. Yeah, it has to have some way of specifying where these variables are. But why, why do they need to, so we kind of already said, okay, they need to specify where these variables are. But can the addresses of where these boxes are for A, B, and C, should they change every time this program's run? Not necessarily need to, they can. How about this code? So let's think about it in two ways, right? So not only do we need to define where this variable is used, I mean, define the location, define a location for these variables of where they are in memory. But now what happens when the compiler wants to say A is equal to 10? When it spits out x86 code to do that, does it tell the CPU, hey, set A to 10? No, it says whatever the memory location of A is stored. Exactly, so it needs to know, right? These instructions here need to know exactly where am I putting this value 10 in memory, right? Where does variable A live? What is the, essentially, the address of variable A, right? And the same here with B, C, and to do this addition. So what the compiler basically does is while it's compiling this, it's going to just decide on memory locations for each of those global variables. So I'm going to do it kind of symbolically here, but we'll see some real addresses that it actually picks. So this says, OK, variable A is at memory location capital A. Variable B is at some location memory B. C is at some location C. And so when it's going through and compiling these instructions in main, it generates assembly code that's equivalent to, hey, in memory, look up memory address A and set its whatever's inside, set the value inside there to be 10. And then get memory B, in memory, look up memory with address B, set it equal to 100. Memory C, set it equal to 10.45. And then set memory A is equal to memory A plus memory B. So actually, once you do this, right, once you have addresses for here, compiling this code becomes fairly easy, right? Because all you have to do is use whatever assembly x86 instructions there are for copying memory and doing addition. So, maybe I'll maybe we'll look at an example. Um, so, for instance, one time that you compile this, right, and so it could say, okay, A is at location 804.96.34, B is at 804.96.38, C is at 804.96.3C. And then it compiles all of these, basically our pseudo instructions, into real x86 instructions. So the way to read this is to move hex a, which is a constant, so it's a dollar sign constant, into this memory location. Right, 804.46, or sorry, 804.9634. So what's hex a? 10. So just from the usage here, what do we know that this is the address of? Memory location A, right? Because we can easily map this to the C code, right? We know that C code moved 10 into memory into variable A, and we can see here the that constant value 10 being copied into some memory location. So we know just from looking at this code that that's where A is. And similarly, we can see move 64 into this other address. We'll call it 38. Uh, move 4127333. <laughs> into EAX, what is this? That's the float value. That's the float value of what? 10.45. <coughs> so how big are floats in C? 32 bits. 32 bits, right? So this is moving that value into register EAX, and then moving EAX into that memory location, right? So one question, since we're looking at this from a black box perspective, why did it do this instead of this? So let's think about it first. Does the CPU, does the CPU know that this is an int and this is a float?
What's hex 64? Oh. It's 100. I don't know it off the top of my head. I, I do those things. <laughs> Most of the operating systems have calculators, right? Actually, the Mac OS calculator has a programmer mode that you can easily switch between 16 Windows 10 and 10. And 10. Good, yes. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Like, ah, I saw a student like, wait, was it one of you? What? No, I don't think it was. I think it was a student in my grad class who would look up online like a hex calculator. <laughs> like, you know your OS does that. All right. Yes. Okay, so back to the question, right? Does this, does the compiler, so is this a valid integer? What's an, what is an invalid integer, actually? Or int. Let's not use integer, right? Int. I don't think there is one. I don't think there is one, right? Any 32-bit pattern will be a valid int. Depending on what kind of integer, whether it's unsigned or signed. Uh, it'll, have, it'll have different values. Yes. Value. So how you interpret that right. integer, right? <laughs> unsigned, signed may vary. But fundamentally, any 32-bit pattern can be an int. Say that again? No, I'm just being uh, yeah, that's not 32-bit, right? That's the trick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, once it's, exactly. Once it's, it's bigger than an int, you need something else, like a long. Right, so I can have, I don't know what, maybe I'll do it. Uh, I don't know exactly what this value is in decimal, right? But if you said A is equal, well, let's do that. All right, so this is what, four, one, two, Seven, three, 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 three. Right. So if I said x was, what's this? One billion nine hundred uh, ninety-three. I'm not gonna read it. If I said um, a was this value, right? Then we would see in the code, hey, move this hex value into whatever that memory location is, right? We'd see the exact same sequence of operations. So to the CPU. Or at least, I guess we should be clear, we're talking specifically about the x86 CPU, right? So uh, could there be CPUs that know about floats versus ints? Yes. Is x86 one of those? No. And I think most do not. Right? So to our, um, to our program, we have no idea that the float. So then why does it move it into a register and then move that register into this memory location? Yeah? So the compiler knows it's a float, so it moves it into a floating point register. Mm. So the CPU can handle it and then it moves it. Very, actually that's a great point. Um, not quite in this instance, but yes. So that's the important thing to know. This code that is generated, the x86 code does not know about the types, but the compiler knows about the types. Right? So if we're going to do addition on this floating point number, we'd actually see it move this value into floating point registers and use the floating point registers to do the addition, right? because the compiler knows that. Um, but EAX is a normal register, so it's actually not a floating point register, it's just a 32-bit register. Okay. So that's a great point. Yeah, there are special floating point operations on the CPU that the compiler will take advantage of. So then why? Any theories, hypotheses, guesses, hunches, anything? Oh, probably because a, just because the instruction has to be a certain length, you can't actually have that long of a number directly moved into a memory location as you move into a register first, then it can be moved. Yeah, that's actually, so, I actually don't know 100%. I think you still <coughs> should be able to do it, right? So what assembly language have you studied? MIPS. MIPS. And MIPS, I believe, is a fixed length instruction yeah. set, yeah. right? It's, 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 so x86 is not fixed length. Well, it's, it's variable width. <laughs> but I think it's because, actually, I, so the real answer is because the compiler decided to do it, and it's semantically equivalent to doing it the other way, right? It, to us, the programmer, we don't care if the compiler uses one assembly instruction or 100 assembly instructions to do whatever we want it to do. 
as long as by the time this thing completes, that 10 is in A. Or here, after this completes, 10.45 is in C. Right? That's the only thing that we care about from the programmer's perspective. So this is likely an optimization for that reason. So I think you could do this, move this value into here, but the resulting byte code would probably be longer than these two instructions. So if whatever GCC has some optimizations, and if you compile this with different versions of GCC, you're likely to get different x86 code. You know, the different optimization flags. Yes, yes, all kinds of stuff. So that's part of the problem with trying to look in too much into this reverse engineering part, right? That's why we want to get a kind of a high level of what's going on. So the next thing that happens is it's going to move 634 into EDX. And what was 634? A. And then it's going to move uh, 638 into EAX, which is 638 is B. So what what is it setting up right now? It's setting up the addition. The addition, right? So then it's gonna. Okay, this one's a little bit crazy. Um, <laughs> it actually is really well. Okay, once you understand what it's doing, is it's the one addition? Sure. Yes. So it is doing an addition here. It is. So load effective address is a way to easily do address computation. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but it's basically uh, take the second parameter times the third parameter. So EAX times one plus EDX, move that into EAX uh, for loops. So by, by loop, so if you think of this is the starting address of your buffer, right? This is the size of the buffer, and this is your index into the buffer. So it's going to calculate the offset of that buffer by doing just simple addition. So is there no just straight up adder? Oh, there is. Why there is. Do that? I don't know. Wouldn't that be faster? <laughs> there might be. That's why we trust compiler writers <laughs> to write compilers. I'll also <laughs> say, this is GCC 6.7 that we're using, right? I think the newer one will actually change this to an add. Why is it putting the value in the address that was assigned that B was assigned to? Does it matter? Uh, it's not, remember, it's only putting it in this register. It hasn't actually committed it to memory yet. So we have to actually look at the next instruction to see it's going to move this result into 34, right, where 34 is A. Exactly. Yeah, so that's one of the tricky things is decoding this. But I guess I should probably just say now, you don't have to memorize how all this stuff works. We're using this to understand how real systems actually implement these techniques. Actually, look. Okay. Uh, so I have it in the notes here, but I'll go over it right now. Um, so like teed up, ready to go. So let's write it up real quick, compile it. Yes, writing code in front of all of you is always so it's awesome. It's like three lines. Or like five lines. Big deal. <laughs> all right. Yeah, we'll do it. Okay. Let's see. I believe I'm in the wrong class. Uh, what, did, what class? Who are you, people? What am I doing here? Do you want an exam? No. Yeah. <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> okay. Zero, so we're going to compile this. Uh, GCC. We're going to compile with N32, which makes it be 32 bit compilations. This is a 64 bit operating system. Uh, global example.c, so it's then going to compile it into write a dot out. Mm -hmm. um, then I can use object dump dash capital D. So this will disassemble all sections of the file of this uh, a dot out binary. And then I'm going to pipe that through less so I can tap through it. So we can actually see that this terminal is way too big. <laughs> the font size here. Kills me when it's... Mm, okay, close enough. All right, so we can actually see there's a lot of junk here. That's all the operating system stuff. Uh, this is actually all the elf stuff. So, yeah, part of it, it's 
There's else stuff. There's some libc stuff in here. Um, we can search for main. And this is our actual function. So what's really cool is on the left here, it shows you at when your program executes at these memory locations are the instructions, the code of your program. And in the middle column are the actual bytes of each of these columns. And then on the right are all of the x86 interpretations of those instructions. Right? So assembly is just a very easy one-to-one -one mapping between assembly and the bytes. Right? So it's very easy to go back. It's a lot more difficult to go back from this to the C code. Right? But we can see here that we move A into, uh, oh, it did do the same one, 804, 96, 34. Uh, move 64 into 804, 83. Move that guy, our floating point guy, into EAX. EAX into that thing. Uh, move this back into EDX. Move this into EAX, the load effective address. The move EAX back to 34. Move 0 into EAX, the pop, the return, and then we're done. So you can do this with your programs. I, it's actually really uh, instructive to look at these and see, OK, how does the compiler actually do for loops and all kinds of loops. You can, I don't know, I learn a lot every time I look at these things. OK, oh, and then we can do, let's see. I'm going to plan on doing this. Uh, read to elf. So we can look at the a dot out section. Let's see, there's some way to do all of the sections. Yeah, dash s. Read elf dash s. And this will show, man, this is like really bad. OK, how do I zoom out? No, not with that one. Normal size, there we go. All right, can you all read this? No? It's fine. OK. Basically, what this table says, so in this L file, right, this L file is just a bunch of bytes on disk. So this tells the operating system how to turn those bytes on disk into an actual program. So it says, for instance, um, the, where is our code? The dot text? Yeah, so at this segment is all of that, all of the code that we just wrote, our x86 instructions. And it tells us, if I go to the top here, it actually tells us that, OK, so this offset is the offset in the file, 2e0. So at byte 2e0 into the file, for 18c bytes, that length, put all those bytes here at 0804.82e0. So put that in memory. So the OS knows exactly how to map that into memory. Just like, I believe, let's see. Any remember offhand what those addresses were? Yeah. Something. Twenty-eight. I think these will be in here in the BSS segment. Yeah. So this is where uh, our variables are going to live. So this is how it tells the OS there will always be memory at this location here, and it will be properly allocated. Cool. And then let's see. Is there anything else interesting here? Uh, no. It's a whole bunch of stuff that happens for dynamic linking and all that stuff, but we won't go into that right now. Local variables are actually pretty easy, right? The compiler just decides and says, okay, here, at this memory location, is this value, right? So what constraints do we have on local variables? Scope. Scope. What does that mean? If it's in the scope, it exists. If you need to scope it, Usually, usually placed on the stack. Why placed on the stack, though? Isn't that just is that just an academic, or is that a sorry, not an academic, but a, conceptual? Like, uh, is that an implementation detail? Well, it's an actual thing that the, that the compiler actually like implements. Right. Yeah. And they're, they're usually temporary. They're usually temporary. What does that mean? So we know the scope rule. So we know that after that scope leaves, right, that variable should go away. Does that mean we wouldn't write them into memory? Ooh. So that's actually an incredibly tricky question. Um, because so to be very safe, yes, you always have to write variables to memory. Because if you think about 
you can memory map processes to each other, right, so that they share memory. So then you want to make sure that every write to that variable is reflected in that other process. So you need to ensure that there's no way for, uh, for the compiler to optimize that write to memory away because it's like, oh, you're not using that. So there's actually, in C, there's the volatile keyword. Um, and that means that that memory you always have to access. You can't like store that variable in, uh, in registers or anything like that. But yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff about memory safety and what kind of optimizations the compiler can do. Okay, what other things about local variables? Can other functions access our local variables? Are functions local variables? I mean, functions have scope the same way variables do, but I don't know if they're exactly the same. Yeah. So like if you, if you have like an integer local variable and then you call another function but you pass that function the address of that integer mm -hmm. you can access that local variable. Okay, say that again. So if you have a local variable, integer, like just an integer, and then you pass another function the address of that mm -hmm. local variable, that function can then access that local yeah, variable. Yeah, right, so by default, no, as programmers we can't just straight up access some other function's local variables, right? Even if they're the function that called us, I mean, we shouldn't be able to, right? That They have to be passed as parameters to our function, right? Um, yeah, so where can, so think about you're writing a compiler, right? Where, so we want to think again about kind of broadly designed things, right? So where could the compiler place local variables? The stack. The stack. Could place on a stack? Registers. Registers? Yeah, it could place it in registers, right? Registers are a lot faster than memory. What about global memory? Right, why not just use the same technique we saw and for every local variable, give it a global memory? Could it then be accessed by the rest of the program? Could it then be accessed? Well, the compiler is doing the, I mean, technically yes, but technically, your memory can access, like if you have, if you're accessing memory directly, you're violating the semantics of C kind of right. anyways, right? I mean like, under under the hood though, like you mm -hmm. could then interpret like. Right, the compiler could still. Like in terms of safety. And right, security. the compiler could still enforce, right, security mechanisms that say, hey, only certain, like only within the scope can you actually access this variable, but still implementation wise, place those variables in global variables. So why do we do this? What's the problem with this? Seems a lot simpler, right? Why use a stack? Why not use global chunks of memory? Yeah. Um, if it's a big program, you would use a ton of memory. If it's a big program, you use a ton of memory. Yeah, that's a good point, right? So you'd have uh, for every fun you've got functions that never get called, right? But you'd still have memory allocated for that function in those local variables. Yeah. If you put your local variables in global memory uh, after the function is done executing, you have to clean it out, right? Or else you just waste memory. Maybe, yeah, but if we're allocating it beforehand, but still, it could be actually, I mean, kind of with both those questions, right, that could actually be a good argument for doing it like this in an embedded systems environment where you, or a real-time operating system where you have, like, hard guarantees on resource usage and all this kind of stuff, right? So here, at least, it's bounded, and you know it's only ever going to use this much memory. But let's say the compiler enforces the access, right? So this is just an implementation detail, right? So the compiler enforces that, hey, you can't access somebody else's variable, just like it does currently, right? You can't write code really without passing addresses and all this kind of stuff to access some other function's variable. Yeah? Um, I could see you running into issues with having multiple variables with the same name and the compiler not knowing which one you're trying to access. Okay, good. Multiple variables with the same name. What does that mean? So like if you have a for loop somewhere, like pretty much any time I use a for loop, it's always going to die equal zero, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. But I have, if I have like 20 for loops in my code, I'll have 20 in I's. But if they're global, which in I am I looking at? But the compiler knows, right? The compiler always knows based on the scope which I you're referring to. So it could give maybe each I a unique name that identifies it, like append the scope to the name. So it just seems like extra things that it doesn't need to do. 
<laughs> the issue that would happen there is if you, the programmer, make an error, right. and you're trying to access an I that you shouldn't, the compiler, it's nice if it yells at you <laughs> instead of giving you the wrong data. Nice, okay. Uh, I'd still argue that the compiler could still enforce that, right? Because it knows all the scoping rules. So when you access an, when it sees an I access, it would know do the scoping rules allow this, right? But what if you're confused? What if what you want is not what the scoping rules are saying? What if what if you say I want global int I? Well, you declare it globally, right? Just like normal. But this I is a, this is an implementation detail, right? I mean, like, uh, like, what if I, what if I'm like, I wanted to read my mind when I say I, I want to know exactly what I want. What if I wanted to read my mind? I do. I would love the computer to read my mind. Yes. So let's think about it this way. I'm gonna argue that you. This is definitely something you completely do not want to have because it restricts what types of programs you can write. Why would that be? So let's think about it like this. Let's look at a simple factorial program. Right? What's the factorial of n? What's the base case? n is 0, return 1. Otherwise, what else? Yeah, return n times the factorial of n minus 1. So Let's say we use global memory to store, well, local variables, and local variables include parameters, right? Could we write this factorial function with using global memory for the values? Why can't you do recursion? Because that int n only exists once. Right. Every copy of this n is different for every invocation of the function factorial. Right? But if it's global, then but if it's global and you only ever have one allocation of it, right, the programs are going to be overriding their local variables. <laughs> right? And this would happen in any place on the call stack, right? This is, I mean, recursion is one thing when you want the same function to call itself. When you have one function A that calls B, B that calls C, C that calls A, A that calls B, right? You need to have multiple invocations of a function. Right? So this idea is kind of out, right? We don't really want that. I mean, so there actually are older programming languages, I believe, like, I want to say Fortran. They actually did this. So you couldn't actually write recursive functions. You could only have sub procedures. So you could only call one function to do something, and then that function could not call any other function. So is it possible to do recursion? No. It's not possible. Yeah, just like, right, so we, so any local variables on here, right, because we saw stack allocation, right? So anytime a function's invoked, there's going to be a new copy of local variables specifically for that invocation of that function, right? We don't have to worry about if that function was previously called before we call that function, otherwise there's going to be some overwriting, right? So the alternative here, instead of using global memory, Right? Let's use what's kind of what let's call scratch memory. Right? So let's use some memory that we're free as not really the compiler, well, kind of as the compiler, as the x86 code, we're free to move and write to and change things. Right? And we'll know we're not going to erase real memory, we're not going to destroy any anything else that's happening. And so this is where the stack in stack comes in. So this stack is essentially scratch memory for functions, right? And this scratch memory also comes in handy. So how many registers does the MIPS machine have? 16. 16? Seems like a lot. Oh, it's like 30 something. I think like 30? Wow, it seems like a lot. Uh, it's a number. All right, this is yeah, making my point not very great. OK, <laughs> how many instructions? How many registers does x86 have? I actually don't have the number off the top of my head. I, don't know. I believe it's like around 15 or so. Uh, it has about five or six general purpose registers, and there's a bunch of other registers that do other things, right? So, right. Where does the CPU actually perform computations? Can in the CPU? 
in the CPU from values in registers, right? So typically you can't uh, store, well, most machines you can't say add this memory location to this memory location and put it in this memory location, right? You have to bring the values into the registers, compute on them, and then store the results, right? So this is another reason why you might want scratch memory. Maybe you're computing something, A plus B plus C plus G plus E plus G plus Q minus 12 times 13 or whatever, right? There's a lot of intermediate results that actually may not fit in all your registers. Um, so in this case, you want some scratch memory to save values that you can come back to. Uh, so this, uh, the stack is used in MIPS, ARM, x86, x86-64, a lot of different architectures. And so what we'll look at in this class, whenever we draw stacks, they go from high to low. So high memory to low memory, and they grow decreasing. Yes. Um, so this means that functions can use this stack by pushing values onto the stack and popping things off and making sure that they can store values there. Um, so on x86, the register ESP, SP for stack pointer, has the address of the, what we call the top of the stack, right? Thinking of a stack logically where you push things on. Uh, it's the bottom of the stack when you think about it from high to low. So we can push things onto the stack, so we can push values, like we can say push the contents of register EAX onto the stack, which will move this which will store the value in EAX on the stack and move the stack down. And we can do the opposite. We can pop values from the stack into registers. Um, cool. All right, so we'll continue this on Wednesday. We're going to go over a detailed example of how the stack works and how uh, x86 can support functions.